Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nice to, well, at least uh, if not see, at least feel your presence in this lecture. So it's my pleasure to welcome you in uh, our course, Fairy Tales of uh, Theoretical Physics. Let me tell you first about the main idea of the course and uh, second about organization because uh, as far as organization is concerned it has been changed much um, since uh, previous years good so what is the idea of the course the idea of the course is that uh, nobody uh, tells you in our in your education what is uh, theoretical physics in general. There are courses which you can call theoretically theoretical with many formulas, but they're not precisely about theoretical physics. Theoretical physics is not a, a kind of a, a about a certain topic certain field of physics. It's a kind of method which uh, permits you to do quality work in many various fields of physics. Uh, that's how we come to this course. It's not about a specific topic. It is a collection of stories, tales, which are chosen to illustrate methods, beauty, power of theoretical physics. So it's not done by single or two or three teachers as most courses which you follow. Uh, we are eventually seven people. Uh, what unites us is more or less a kind of profession or inclination. We are all theoretical physicists. Although we use different methods, different approaches to the science, to the physics. It's also so that we are all at the department of uh, quantum nanoscience here in Delft. But also, it doesn't mean that everything which we uh, will tell you is about nanoscience, or rather not. Uh, good, I didn't say that. Uh, I kind of prefer that all uh, questions appear in the chat. And I do appreciate the questions because I, uh, at least I don't feel alone speaking to my computer, right? That would be nice for me. Uh, right, and, uh, uh, but if I, the answer, the, your question is not answered in the chat, so uh, it means I missed it somehow, so please uh, unmute yourself and speak up, speak up. Uh, very good. I understand there's no questions so far. So seven lectures. We are all from quantum nanoscience. We are all theorists. What we will give? There will be 12 lectures. And uh, kind of in average, uh, each of the participants will deliver two lectures. Again, as I said, topics are not really connected. Um, that E our lectures. Each lecture comes with a homework, with a, some uh, task to do, a problem to solve. You should not do it immediately, or whatever you whatever you wish. Uh, nobody would uh, check your homework immediately after the lecture. Um, Razem, let me outline what we will do during the semester. Because once again, it is different from what we did uh, previous years. 
Um, there will be two tests during the semester. There will be two online tests. Um, it would be multiple choice questions about the lecture material. So there will be a test uh, somehow end of March. I don't remember, there must be a schedule somewhere where the date of the test is set. Right, you will receive uh, the questions to your mail and you would submit it uh, to, uh, you know, to Bright, Brightspace page. Uh, find sir, the tests uh, about lecture material, multiple choice questions. Uh, that's one of the activities we do in semester. Another activities during the semester, you would have to do something really strange, which differs from your usual tasks. Namely, you would have to make your own problem. Uh, how to do this? First, look at the topics of the lectures. Even if the lectures are not given, course material provides you enough information about these lectures, there are slides, there are topics of the lectures. All right, uh, then you would uh, choose a topic uh, which you like. Look at homework as kind of uh, example and try to make your own problem. Be creative. Since creativity has no limits uh, and we are still at educational institution, uh, there must be some reference for you. This reference is the corresponding instructor. You have a topic which is given by a certain person. Once you have a rough idea of your problem, talk to this instructor, explain your idea. If it is appreciated or instructor would give you some hints to do it differently, that is all uh, parts of this of this uh, assignment. Um, this assignment, this uh, problem will have to be delivered by the end of the semester. I don't remember exact dates, somewhere in June. Um, all right, and your instructor will grade it. Good, in two tests, for this problem, you get certain uh, number of points and there's some threshold number of points um, which allows you to come for examination. Right, and here homework becomes an essential component. So there are homework tasks and uh, you need four homework assignments done, written, submitted before you make appointment for examination. Examination is oral, we need two teachers. Well, we, you got an appointment for examination. Uh, the line is that uh, this appointment has to be made before some date in the end of September. So you could just uh, make your all examinations uh, during summer, whatever, then you have time, you can get examination for this course. We don't want to interfere with your uh, main exam schedule. Uh, fine, uh, what else? Right. Um, it can be four homework problems uh, uh, from um, the lectures, or it can be three homework problems from the lecture, plus the solution of your own creative problem. So when you submit this problem, you don't have to submit the solution, but there must be an idea of solution, of course. 
and they come in for our exam, you might submit the solution of your whole problem. But it uh, sounds a bit complex. I uh, did my best to put everything into web page. There are more detailed explanations of this. Uh, but anyway, I would uh, appreciate questions at this stage. Oh, yeah, sorry, I don't know if you can hear me. Oh, okay, that's okay. Um, so what kind of exam would this be? Is it also multiple choice? I can hear you, but it's rather difficult. Oh. Say it again, please. I'm sorry, the uh, final exam will also be uh, multiple choice? No, no, that will okay. be a oral examination. Uh, so you come with your homework, which you did, and first teachers ask you questions about the homework. So how did you do this? How well you have understood what you have done? Uh, then there can be also questions about all other lectures. But well, right. kind of uh, not that, so kind of awaitedly uh, rather lately. Uh, mostly it's your own work, which is expressed in terms of homework, and this is a main component of your grade. So part of your grade you get for these two tests and uh, um, uh, the problem, and part of the grade you get uh, from the uh, results of uh, the exam. I guess it's uh, 40 to 60. Uh, to 60. Okay. Uh, right, uh, good. If uh, it's strange that I don't see chat window. Perhaps I have to stop the share for a while. And yeah, there's nothing in the chat. Um, anyway, uh, let me go on. Let me first uh, give some uh, short introduction to the whole course, uh, trying to exp inspire you or to give the notion again, why do we give such course? What are topics? Uh, what is the approach? Right, first of all, we should say that it's not our original idea to give such a course. A uh, similar course is been given in uh, Cambridge uh, by this uh, professor, Professor Khmelnytsky. So here is his real uh, number, here's his uh, theoretical representation. Um, all right, so the idea of tales is eventually due to Professor Khmelnytsky. But well, uh, if you look at uh, the um, uh, Cambridge curriculum, you would find that this is a course in mathematical physics. Well, that would suggest that professor is perhaps professor in mathematical physics. That doesn't work this way. In fact, he is a professor in condensed matter physics something about materials. So what would he do for his uh, research? Perhaps looking at the materials and their properties, uh, um, trying to collect information about spectroscopical uh, conduction and thermal properties, nothing of the kind. Uh, most uh, part of his working time he is making such drawings which do not resemble anything uh, connected to materials. Fine, that brings us to the question, what is precisely the theoretical physics? 
is it mathematical physics or condensed matter or what? What is the topic of theoretical physics? Well, here's a description of a uh, field of theoretical physics. Do you see the description? Can you read it? Well, uh, it's up to you to read it. Theoretical physics doesn't have any field except uh, empty sheet of paper which you fill with some formulas. Like poets, um, suppose they work with a computer, just put, put, uh, put something onto paper or whatever, K in into computers. If uh, one considers uh, kind of practical activities of a theoretical physicist, it would be precisely this. Good point to notice that it is somehow related to much more practical research. It is somehow related to nature. It is somehow connected to uh, our understanding of nature, ability to predict, to control nature, to invent new things which do not exist in nature, but uh, we want them to do. That's the most puzzling part of the story. But perhaps you have heard about this. Since you come to this course, you have heard perhaps about this. Uh, since you have heard, um, I would like to you to tell something about this connection. What do you think? What is the process of theoretical work and where and why is it connected to nature or whatever experiment to reality? Let's go step by step. So I'm a theorist, you are a theorist. Where do you start? Oh, Jesus, it looks like I'm missing chart, uh, chart window again. Uh, chart. Unexplained phenomena people have discovered, that's one opinion. current understanding the model of the universe and how that compares to experiments. Results in other people experiments. Do experiments to co confirm the a, a, a hypothesis. You start with experiment. Um, can be different. But I guess you kind of uh, mention the uh, main points. Let me switch back to shoring. Um, first, of course, there are some inputs, which is not, uh, uh, which hasn't uh, appeared in your mind, but it input of our others.
it can be a question related to experiment. It can be a question which was raised by your colleagues. It can be uh, something which uh, you just read somewhere. There are some input which certainly has something to do with reality. Then next step is the following. Having this input, which is uh, frequently unstructured um, and uh, can come in many uh, uh, possible forms, you make it a problem. Namely, you make a model. So there's some work already at this stage. Then you work it out. There can be some loops at this place. You try to work it out, it doesn't work. You have to do something with the model, simplify it or enrich it, different things. After work out, you got a result and let's call it prediction. solution and this is your output also this stage it doesn't go automatically just from plain formulas, you have to do something which can be uh, implemented in reality. Not all, all, every mathematical result would count. And also you want to get people interested in what you have predicted. So that's how it goes. Uh, kind of uh, nobody, well, it, it would be difficult to predict what will happen with your output, whether it will give rise to new experiments and become discoveries, or nobody notices this, somebody could uh, make uh, same predictions faster than you. But this is your work. And uh, there are tools to do this work at all three stages, making a model, working this out, and uh, re um, um, making predictions from the solution of the model. And what uh, makes theoretical physics um, kind of separate field to some extent is that these methods are pretty much the same for all fields of physics, for most fields of natural science, uh, which uh, looks like uh, magic, which looks like a fairy tale. But by some chance, uh, our world is uh, made such that these methods are very similar. So there is, for instance, wave equation, you know, it can be applied to light, it can be applied to uh, waves we will consider today, uh, waves on shallow water. Um, it can be applied to hot plasmas in uh, uh, in the reactors, doesn't matter, same question. Same uh, methods to model, to go from some general physical description to 
an equation. Same methods to present the solutions. So it's all the same. And uh, again, we will illustrate these methods uh, during our presentations. I, I personally like my, like, like, like my job. I, um, I really feel inspired when I have a progress as a here, here, and here. I have sense of achievement. Um, although I just uh, more or less uh, gain something into computer or, um, you know, spoiling good paper with my pen. Good. Any questions about this? Don't see any. Speak up if I miss your question. Let me get to my particular tale. Let us talk about waves on shell robot. Oh, that's a typical picture. You see the water, the waves but we need to formalize it. Uh, we need to get equations which describe this. We have to make a model. And uh, I will uh, present a rather lengthy division which will um, bring us to a certain equation. Which is called KDV equation. If you're real Dutch, if you're patriot, you should know what KDV mean. Who can tell me that? Are there any people of uh, Dutch origin in my audience? Uh, yes, but I'm afraid I don't know. Um, fine. Anyway, it's Kortweg de Vries. Was Professor Kortweg and uh, his student de Vries which actually elaborated this equation, have derived this equation, look at the solution, no, he did, they didn't do um, all the job. It was uh, about 120 years ago. Uh, right, and uh, uh, after that, there was a story about this particular question. It's already a bit more abstract. Uh, we don't talk about this detail, but it appears to be that this the solutions of this equation, which really describe waves, have some funny properties. And uh, there are methods, complex methods, to solve this nonlinear equation exactly. Uh, and uh, the study of this equation and similar equations, which can be solved with the same method, uh, made a little revolution in theoretical physics, in uh, mathematics. It was a outburst of activities and a new technology has been elaborated. Unfortunately, it doesn't work for all, Nonlinear equations which you can have in mind, but there is a possibility to solve some equations, got the properties, uh, intuition about physical behavior, results, predictions. 
and I will shortly outline this technology. Anyway, it will be a long way. I will tell you some stories along the way. Um, let's get our hands dirty. But please, uh, for those who care about Dutch identity, Kort Werd de Vries. It's really famous Dutch scientists. Almost that as Lawrence and things like that. Uh, right. So, let us talk about water. Let us understand how we can uh, mathematically describe uh, waves in the water. What are the assumptions which we can make, which uh, uh, we can easily get from the notion, from whatever, not from everyday life, but from some general concepts, um, and try to make a mathematical model out of that. First of all, let us assume that water is incompressible, in distinction from gas, from something similar. If you press water, it doesn't really change uh, uh, its volume. Second, let's try to understand the, um, the source of wave motion. We don't have much candidates except gravitation. Okay, let's make note of that. So we have to take gravitation into account. Good, now let's get closer to the description. Let us understand how we parameterize the wave. Uh, let me draw it first. Right. First of all, I would assume uh, for the model that uh, propagation is one dimensional. Uh, so there is a very long wave front and I consider only coordinate perpendicular to this wave front. Then there will be some profile of this water. Water is shallow, that means that I have bottom. Right, so how can I describe this? Well, we can describe it with a single function which depends on coordinate x. Let's call this function height. Right. So there are some non-equilibrium position of this kind uh, and it moves at another moment, it would uh, look like this. So it depends on coordinate and time. Now I want to derive dynamical equations for this variable. So how do I do this? Go to workshop and choose proper tool. One can uh, think of several tools to do this as any job. Uh, it can be usually accomplished with several tools. I would uh, take Lagrangian from my tool set. It's just the simplest one. This work is, uh, uh, can be done most efficiently with the help of Lagrangian. Right, 
what's Lagrangian? Actually, uh, even students who have heard about Lagrangian, and I presume that everybody has heard once about Lagrangian, um, sometimes uh, understand it a little bit uh, differently. For us, it is enough that Lagrangian has the terms potential energy and kinetical energy. And uh, what um, kind of general uh, rules of theoretical physics uh, tell us that we want to express kinetic and potential energy in terms of this variable. And then vary, vary this Lagrangian and from variation, you got the equations. Those who know what Lagrangian is, question to the students. Um, who knows, say yes or no, um, uh, who knows that the equation of motions are obtained from variation of a Lagrangian. It's something which you got in classical mechanics. Let us see. Yes, 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 yes. Great, 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 great. I'm flattered. I see many yes, many yes, yes. Fine, good. Then our next step is to is to express these uh, uh, two parts in terms of h, and then we are in business. We can derive the equation. Um, All right, first let us uh, deal with potential energy and this is easy part, right? We consider small volumes of water, as a water, a small volume, and we add up energies of all these volumes. All right, coordinate X, uh, coordinate uh, y, so um, the volumes are situated at um, different y's, at different heights. Uh, and this is the energy of each volume, g times mass of the volume times y, right? So what I do here, I replace uh, mass by density times volume and integrate it over x. And look, I immediately get what I want. I express um, potential energy in terms of, of the desired function. Well, there is um, uh, kinetic energy and this kinetic energy, we have to do much more involved job. Uh, very good, how to start. First, let us understand that uh, also in kinetic energy, we have to add small volumes, but now each volume comes with velocity, right? Density here, this is volume. And those are components of velocity. Good. Then what we have to do is to express velocity in terms of uh, time dependent, coordinate dependent height. Wow. Kind of losing notion of time. 
It happens with Zoom. So if you feel that I, um, I'm talking too slow, I'm talking too fast, I really appreciate uh, the feedback because, um, yeah, since uh, there's not so much contact between the audience, I can get lost at uh, Fine. Let us understand how we can do this. And let us um, uh, also understand that there are different constraints which will determine the solution which we want. Right. First constraint works in all points, and this is continuity equation. What does it show? It shows conservation of molecules of water in each point. Change of density, um, that change of number of particles in small volume equals to divergence of the flow from this volume. Fine, but here we can immediately simplify the stuff because our water is not compressible. So all derivatives of rho do not exist. And that's a constraint we have. Divergence of velocity zero. Uh, second constraint and rather boundary condition, we have the bottom at zero, which means that velocity here cannot have components perpendicular to the bottom. Uh, water cannot flow there. It's always parallel. And we need a similar equation uh, uh, at the surface. It looks a bit comp complex, but uh, there's nothing wrong with this. So if um, height is, uh, does have gradient, then velocity in this direction just rises the height. If it has gradient, the height is shifted by a velocity in this direction. Right, that gives right to, to this term. So this is boundary condition at the surface. You still have to find u everywhere at all points x and y. Right, so let's see how we do this. And we do this with a method which uh, is called method of Lagrange multiplier. Also, one of the uh, most useful tools in theoretical physics. Let's see, there is a, a good. So, the dot is um, derivative with respect to time, and prime is derivative with respect to x. Um, Right, it's applied to, to um, height, which depends on x only, right? Good, uh, so let's have um, this kinetic energy, velocities, and let's also write this constraint. It has to be zero. And we can present it as a result of variation with respect to some extra field, field phi. Uh, let us see, so during given this course, I have seen very varying knowledge about Lagrange multipliers. Is there a demand to tell about Lagrange multipliers in more detail?
Yes, please. Okay. Good. How can I do this? I add a page. Let us consider for simplicity just two variables, x and y. And there is a function of this two, which has minimum somewhere at this point. Good, we could uh, find this minimum by uh, writing the equations. Uh, X derivative is zero, Y derivative is zero. Okay, so in equations find the minimum. The problem is different. We want to find a minimum, not in the whole space of two variables, but a constraint. Let me write it as f x y equals zero. Good, we want to find minimum at this uh, particular line. Well, uh, if you look at this picture, we understand that perhaps it's somewhere here how to express this mathematically. Uh, natural idea would be the following. To express y in terms of x, put it back to the equation, got equation for single variable, for variable x, and then minimize it. That looks natural way but it, it implies that you can solve this constraint, you can express uh, y through x in terms of this constraint. Frequently that doesn't work or is very inconvenient. So another method is applied. Method which uh, has been put forward by Lagrange. And uh, if you look at it, it is crazy. Instead of reducing number of variables, we introduce yet another variable. And we write something to minimize, which has original function, R minus third variable. that we have to uh, minimize. So we vary this equation. Okay, let me polish whatever. Good, if we vary it with, with respect to mu, that will give all us the constraint. So the constraint is satisfied, so we are sure that we're looking at the minimum precisely at this red curve. Eh? Uh, and then we just do the rest. And from these three equations for three variables, we can finally find the minimum. So that's how it works for three variables. It works also the same method works for any number of variables. So let me go back here. Here's a constraint. Here's the Lagrange multiplier, but it is defined in each point of x, in each point of time. Good, what to do next? We would try like to vary this Lagrangian to find u and express it in terms of phi. Right? So we have to vary these equations. What does it mean? 
we take u of x and uh, replace it, add a small variation to it. Same with uh, uy. We substitute it to the Lagrangian. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I uh, see your question, Fabian. Just let me uh, finish. We substitute it to Lagrangian. And, <coughs> and um, uh, find variation of the Lagrangian with respect to these uh, changes. And we equate this derivation to zero and thereby we express u in terms of pi. We want to find the minimum of u, not just usual minimum at, we want to find the minimum at fixed pi, right? Since we are looking, we are varying Lagrangian anyhow, we are looking for its minimum. This is valid procedure. We just find the same minimum in terms of different variables. All right, Fabian, is the answer clear? Yes. Good. Uh, so let me write uh, this is uh, the variations quickly. Perhaps I have to make a break. Uh, let's go for five more minutes and then we have uh, 10 minutes break. Um, so that, for instance, upon variation will become uh, two times ux delta u that will become, I write variation only. But since this um, term is under sign of integral, we can revert this derivative and rewrite this as delta u x is derivative of phi. That's a very common trick. When you vary, you don't want to have a, a variation on the sign of derivative. You just shift it to another variable. Okay, here we are. We express velocity in terms of phi. Right? It has to satisfy the constraint. Divergence of u e must be zero. This is zero. So we may immediately got equation for phi. And we express kinetic energy in terms of phi. Another punch to see uh, whatever one can call it beauty or one can call it barring thing. Same variable, same equation appears in very different uh, fields of physics. So if you solve it one field, you can solve it in another field. Uh, phi, what do you usually denote with phi? Which physical quantity? Perhaps you have used uh, other notations, but for me, phi is electrostatic potential. And the questions which we got is what is called Laplace equation for electrostatic potential in the absence of charges. 
So in fact, without noticing it, we are in the field of electrostatics. Good. So we got kinetic energy and uh, right is also in terms of electrostatics, it looks a uh, square of electric field, a potential gradient. All sounds very natural. Good, we still have to solve this equation. And I guess it's a good time for a break. So let's have a 10 minute break. Uh, it depends on students. I guess uh, I, I, I like breaks and I expect you to like the breaks. If you don't like breaks, please write me about this. At the moment, 10 minutes break. Very good. Um, so we got equation for this potential for our velocities. Um, it's yet impossible to solve it uh, as good as we can. So we have to do approximations. And the first approximation is uh, already suggested by the title of my uh, tale. Uh, it is that uh, water is shallow, right? We need to express it in mathematical terms, right? So usually we compare water with our own lens. That makes it uh, shallow or deep. Uh, right, so now what we want to compare the depths of water with. There must be some land scale. Uh, look, I, 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 it, it was not intended as a rhetorical question. I would love an answer. What makes the water shallow? We are not there in the problem. We cannot compare it with two scales. Usually we compare the depths of water with our own small y. In comparison with what? We need to compare two scales once again. And can say that quantities, yes, yes, Fabian, precisely. So the some wavelengths of this water and shallow means that this wavelength is bigger than the depth. Very good. Now we can expand electrostatic potential. Assuming that this term varies slowly. Uh, and uh, then we can just uh, incorporate Taylor expansion in terms of Y. Good, Taylor expansion, let us see it is uh, zero order term in Taylor expansion. And there's a second order term, right? Precisely 
that is my uh, next question. Why do all the terms vanish? Uh, let us recall boundary condition at the bottom. It is zero. It means that all gradients of phi must disappear at zero at the bottom. And this can only be satisfied if all powers are even. Okay, so we take into account yet another piece of information. Boundary condition at the bottom at y equals zero. Fine, then how do we proceed? Well, we could just substitute it to Poisson equation. Derivative with respect to x is here. Uh, this is uh, derivative with, with, with respect to y squared, which uh, I uh, which is different for different ends, and I collected the powers in this row, so I, um, I have an equation to uh, um, express f n from the uh, previous F. Fine. So I applied. I don't know yet the, the zero term, but I know the second term in terms of zero term, first term, and so forth. Right. What we need in this uh, expansion. Uh, we need the leading term that comes with uh, phi naught. And we also need the terms of next order. They contain uh, I will answer your questions. Uh, they contain uh, also second derivative and um, uh, right. So basically, you integrate integrate this term. Uh, take second term in this expansion. Uh, it is clear why the first order term vanishes due to the boundary condition, but why the third order, for example, uh, you can kind of uh, best way to regard it to understand that this is in fact mirror condition. You could kind of mirror your water downwards and then it, 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 uh, the height can be expanded in terms of odd functions only. The recurrent recurrence relation comes from what you do, you substitute this expression into a Laplace equation. Uh, so you have different powers of y, right? This, this gives uh, terms with the same power of y. This, due to the fact that you differentiate it twice, gives the power, if you, if you put, put uh, for instance, uh, two here, it will give you zero power in y. And we equate separately the terms of different powers in Right, so for instance, uh, 
zero power in y, in y. I have a contribution from this second derivative with respect to x. And I differentiate twice y here. I get constant. So I got, uh, let's see what do I got. It uh, looks like, uh, or oh, let's see, do, do I have zero here? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, tw twice I have two times by one. equals to zero. So we equate just powers of y. That's how this recurrence relation comes from. Uh, fine. Uh, right, so I find the energy up to uh, leading and next leading term. Fine. So this is in terms of phi now. And I have boundary condition. That's a boundary condition express velocities in terms of phi, I put it here. Wow, it's all equal zero of course. I could have expressed phi in terms of h and substituted here, but there was yet extra job to do this. Right, we need to resolve this boundary condition, express phi in terms of uh, height. Again, it is convenient to change the variables here. Theorist must be flexible in this respect. So we introduce another variable which is derivative, uh, whose derivative is respect to x is h. What is this variable? Eventually, it's a volume of water up to certain line. That's why we call it omega volume. Right, that looks a little bit simpler. And again, we solve it using approximation of shallow water that uh, high derivatives a smaller approximation of small faith lands. Again, we need a leading term and next to leading term, which contains more omega, more derivatives. Fine. So now we can express phi in terms of omega. Omega is related to H. We put it here. That's a Lagrangian we need to vary. Since I see the chat, I don't see much of Lagrangian, but you do. Right, leading term, next to leading term. Let us work with, uh, 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 with leading terms only. And uh, if we uh, elaborate on this, we got an equation which is not Dutch equation, which is French equation, something all, um, in its usual form. And if we look, if we now linearize this equation, if we consider small waves, small deviations, the Lagrangian will be pretty simple. And it will describe waves. It will reduce to wave equation. And it will uh, give dispersionless waves. What does it mean dispersionless? It's like actually light. Velocity of light does not depend on frequency of light. Right, so it's the same velocity for all waves. And this is not real. This is result of uh, this approximation, sun Vinan approximation leading terms. So we have to bring next to leading terms. Right, 
So now the leading terms, we add terms which are responsible for small dispersion and non-linearity. Here it's dispersion. Here is non-linearity. So we took terms which makes make velocity slightly dependent on the wavelengths. Right, so what do we do next? Since we have waves propagating in certain direction with certain velocity, which almost doesn't depend on wavelengths, it's better to do it in moving frame. Uh, transform variables once again. And these three terms, a little Lagrangian like this, we are almost there. We now can restore original variables. U is now height and obtained by variation of the Lagrangian the following equation. Good. We are there, Kortweg de Vries equations. Derived, if I'm not mistaken, in 1902. Oh, so there were smart people even that time which could do all these derivations. Good. Uh, what we have here, we have two scales, time and length. We have three coefficients here. We can choose time and length scale in such a way that equation becomes simple dimensionless, right? So we transform, I don't know, x to some x prime times coefficient, uh, t to some t prime times coefficient. And we choose these coefficients as to cancel all these terms. Tada! Kortweg de Vries equation in its canonical form. Good. What does it mean? What does it describe? It describes evolution of the bias. It describes dispersion of the bias. And it also catches up nonlinearity. Someone could say velocity also depends on the amplitude of the thing. Right, this is Kortweg de Vries equation. And not only for water waves, there is a set of uh, wave motions where the equation for the waves can be reduced to this form, Kortweg de Vries. I have to look at time. We still have like 25 minutes. So it's time for stories. Or perhaps not. Let us see. Kortweg de Vries equation. There was quite some deviation. There were different der derivations. There were uh, different tricks employed during this deviation. But these tricks are kind of rather same for different fields of uh, theoretical physics. That's why this equation is uh, generic for many types of the waves. Right, let's do something with this equation. And first, uh, let us solve a problem which is not rocket physics, which does not reveal uh, deep properties of this equation, but still useful and that we can do with uh, our hands. All right. Namely, let us consider uniform wave profile. Let us assume collection of waves which just moves with constant velocity, not changing its profile, right? So the profile stays the same and the wave is just shifted in time. All right, how to express this mathematically. Instead of two variables, height depends on single variable only. 
good. We have simpler equation instead of uh, differential equation for two variables, we have uh, one for three. Good, it's still an equation. Its solutions are not very obvious. Uh, yeah, you see how velocity comes here. Now we have extra parameter, actual velocity of the pipes. Good, how to deal with this equation. And again, analogy is a different branch of physics comes into play and help us to solve it explicitly and to, which is more important, to figure out what kind of solutions we can have, right? What is the trick? Well, still some must to do. I integrate this equation over time to reduce the order of derivatives. Okay, from third derivative, I have second. I have constant term uh, and the first derivative becomes zero derivative. Here we are. Right. I look at this equation and uh, it rings a bit as a bow. Does it ring the bell for you? Can you look at the pictures over here, figure out the analogy? Oh, my chat doesn't scroll, but I, I don't see anything in the chart yet. All right. It looks like Newton equation, equation of classical motion for a particle in a potential. So instead of coordinate of particle, I call it coordinate of particle U. And I have acceleration U uh, second derivative. And it equals to some function of U, which is potential, okay? It's much simpler to imagine how a particle oscillates in potential like this than to solve this equation, all right? So this sets me the form of this potential. It's a cubic parabola. It has a minimum somewhere. And if a particle here, I don't have any waves whatsoever. I, um, I have raised my particle and it oscillates like this. So I have waves of small amplitude. I go farther, I increase amplitudes of the wave. The oscillations also become complex in shape. It's not sinusoidal anymore. It's somehow complex. Then finally, I got to this threshold. And uh, the period of oscillations, because uh, so the distance between wave fronts become bigger and bigger and approaches infinity over here. Good, that's what intuition tells us. Mass tells us that we can further reduce the derivatives. We can use energy conservation in this potential. So this is uh, kinetic energy, this is potential energy, and we can express uh, first derivative of U in terms of this potential, and we can finally find the shape of the wave. Or uniformly propagating sequence of waves. All right, but let me come back to a mathematics to real life. And let me reveal that this solution has been discovered experimentally first. 
there was an engineer, uh, let's see, I don't know how uh, you call this engineer in uh, this type of engineer in, uh, in uh, English and Dutch is Watermaster. So um, uh, Russell was responsible for maintenance of channels in Scotland. And um, he frequently spent time just, uh, you know, um, riding along the channels. And once he saw a bark which is, was collided with another bark and there was a wave risen from this collision. To his surprise, this wave propagated without changing its shape. He has found it peculiar. So he just tried the horse. He managed to match velocities and he could follow this uh, wave about a mile. Good experimental observation. So he has wrote a letter to proceedings of uh, Royal Academy of Science. Well, I um, didn't drink much whiskey by that day, but I have seen such a way. Look at the date. Um, nobody could explain it for a number of years. Uh, it took almost uh, 40 years kind of to study the equations and to get to the um, um, equations which would describe nonlinear solutions to the of this kind. And it took 20 more, uh, how much, 25 year, more years to discover the shape of the solution which you can get by integrating quantities, which I described. It's simple analytical form for this solution. Okay, let me spell real name for this wave. It is called soliton. It's called soliton, solitary wave. So it's not a bunch of waves, which we used to see. It's just uh, what Russell's, uh, Russell saw and was surprised with. Good. Uh, velocity of this wave depends on its uh, magnitude. It looks a bit paradoxical, but kind of, if I remember correctly, higher waves propagate faster than lower waves. Good. That has been understood. And uh, there was again silence for a number of years. Uh, Silence was because there were no proper tools to um, solve this equation for, except the uh, isolated cases. Well, we have considered we could solve it without computer, right? Uh, we, then in yet 60 years, um, some Americans just did simulations for fun. They consider two solitons of this kind. You can see it here. One soliton, another soliton. And the different lines here are just different times. All right. You see, as, um, as uh, I promised, a uh, high soliton catches up uh, the uh, lowest soliton. And at this time, they collide. What do you expect when two objects collide? Two cars collide. Just uh, debris. Many, many small waves propagating from this collision point. Here, as you can see from the simulation, the picture is entirely different. It looks like cars just went through each other, retaining their precise shape here and here. There are still manifestation of the collision. If you look at it carefully, 
you see that these lines are shifted. So it looks like there was a time delay before this collision. It took some time for the car to collide, but then it just uh, went on with the same velocity. Good, so there was a computer simulation like this, which put these two people and many mathematicians around into process of thinking. And now his, uh, the story accelerated. It took them just two years to figure out that these equations are very special. And in distinction from most of nonlinear differential equations, they can have exact solution uh, and uh, exact solutions, general exact solutions. Um, that was a kind of revolution. More people began to think of, of it. More people uh, looked at possibility to have exact solutions. So it was discovered uh, very fast for different nonlinear models uh, that we can, that I guess Anton Achmer will tell you about, sine Gordon equation. It's also a nonlinear equation which is used in plasma theory. Uh, okay, a set of models which can be solved exactly. Uh, let me outline um, the technique. I won't outline it operational reason. It's not that after the slides you would be able to solve it, but at least uh, to follow the steps and to show how tricky uh, technologies for solving the equations can be. Good. Uh, what is uh, interesting and what was uh, the first step towards exact solution? Right. First of all, it is convenient to change sign of u, but well, it doesn't matter whether it's height or depth. Then people come to a deer so again, it's the same as with Lagrangian multiplier. You introduce something else, which seems redundant, but it uh, permits you to analyze the problem. They consider kind of Schrodinger equation, which looks like quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation, where potential energy it is given by this density profile. Good string equation has kinetic energy, second derivative comes to the play. This equation has some eigen energies. Right, and there are different solutions of string equation, uh, wave equations is potential. And you can see a, a scattering. Some wave comes from infinity and it uh, is scattered at this wave front. So this scattering uh, can be described as transmission and reflection amplitudes. So all information about the um, potential goes into this transmission and reflection amplitudes. Still potential depends on time. This transmission amplitudes also depend on time. But the point is that they let's see here, depend on time in very peculiar fashion. Eventually, one can understand how these amplitudes, not the potential, but how the amplitudes depend on time for any arbitrary uh, initial conditions. The next step, which is also a non-trivial step, but it was um, possible to do, is to, uh, is to solve inverse scattering problem. Namely, to determine the potential from the results of 
square theory. Good, so now I can shortly outline this technology of um, exact solutions of some nonlinear equations. Uh, I do it in um, comparison with the standard Fourier methods for linear equations. Good. In any case, we start with initial solution. Some uh, distribution of height dependent on x. Right. Then we compute scattering in this potential. Right. Then it's a simple task. We let the scattering data involve. And their time dependence is very simple. That simple point. So we got scattering data at another time moment. And now we have to solve inverse scattering problem and finally get u of x of t. Good, it is uh, sound fancy, but it uh, resembles a bit what we do with uh, when we solve uh, differential equations with Fourier methods. Um, okay, we start with some initial condition. Then we compute Fourier amplitudes, Fourier transformation of this condition. And for this uh, Fourier component, the equation, time evolution equations are very simple separate for each component, we can solve it. We can collect for yet for year transform at a certain time. And then we do inverse for year transform. So it's kind of nonlinear extension of for year method. Fine. I guess <coughs> I told everything what uh, one has to know about this topic. Um, I put many, many details, for instance, interesting um, uh, observation is that these equations, equations of the third have um, infinitely many um, integrals of uh, motion um, which are related to operators which are called like spares. So um, for usual dynamical equations, we could have, for instance, a conservation of momentum. And if we express momentum in terms of height, uh, it would be just linear. This conservation of energy, this is also natural, but in fact, we can generate more and more integrals of motions concerning quantities, which would involve higher orders of, of this height u. Good. So there are many uh, fun things to know about the equations. I did not put in transparency of take home messages. Uh, let me just perhaps quickly go through everything that I have. We have started with this picture. We wanted to make model. And model is in principle formulated at this page already. Um, then we need to do some technicalities to get from the model to the equations, to dynamical equations for this quantity. As you see, it was quite a work. 
but approximations which we do, tricks which we have applied, tools are pretty much a general for uh, physics in general and for mathematical physics, Lagrange multipliers we have, electrostatic potential we have, Laplace equation we got, right? Uh, anyway, uh, we could not live with exact equations. Uh, any model should include some approximations, otherwise it is unsolvable. So we did some approximations or tedious work of elaborating these approximations, uh, uh, collecting terms of different orders, rare region terms. But it's also a kind of uh, technicalities. Right, so we come to the equation. Simple equation, again, has been derived um, more than a century ago. And we can look at simple properties of this equation. We can do it all best. That it appeared to be, and that was not really from the equation level, it appeared to be experimental fact, which could have been explained by this equation. Uh, it took, as you see, many years to get from, to, to relate the equation and experimental discovery. You think the job is done? Well, there is a new look at the same phenomena. There's different view. And people understand that the job is not yet done. There are more interesting things to discover. And uh, that observation of, you know, uh, I would say ghost cars, which can um, collide without changing their shape, um, give rise to a set of uh, new discoveries, new technologies, uh, mathematical technologies. But in fact, it's technology, it can be applied in solving mathematical equations which describe practical setups. Good, I guess I'm done for today. Uh, your try, uh, my time is over. Let me uh, Stop the recording. Oh, Jesus, how can I do this?